Chapter 17, The Arab-Islamic-Israeli Question That the sudden mass disappearance of multiplied millions of people around the world, together with the display of godlike powers by the Antichrist, could cause mankind to worship him and to adopt the new world religion, may make sense for atheists or Hindus or Buddhists, and especially for pseudo-Christians. Muslims, however, could be a different story. Like Hindus and Buddhists, the Arab world would have very little first-hand experience of the trauma caused by the rapture. Unlike syncretistic religions, Islam allows no compromise, and a large percentage of its followers are extremely fanatical in their faith. Further doubts are raised about Arab loyalty to the Antichrist, let alone worshiping him, if Daniel 9.27 and Ezekiel 38.11 teach, as many students of prophecy believe, that the Antichrist makes a pact with Israel, guaranteeing her safety, a pact which he later breaks to lead an all-out attack upon Israel. Such an arrangement, while it lasts, would make the Antichrist the enemy of Arabs. How, then, could the nearly one billion Muslims be expected to become a part of the Antichrist's worldwide revived Roman Empire? Here again we see some remarkable developments in the Arab world taking place at this strategic time in history, along with the incredible developments in Eastern Europe. The similarities are striking. Much attention has been given to the iron and bamboo curtains of communism. Worldwide knowledge of the errors and terrors of that system has contributed to its downfall. At the same time, little notice has been given to the no less extreme and cruel wall that Islam has erected around Arab countries. Recent developments in the Middle East, however, particularly since Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, are bringing significant changes. Recent events are causing the world to take notice at last of the Islamic curtain. Behind that wall of prejudice, any religion except Islam is forbidden. Converts to Christianity have not only been imprisoned for abandoning Islam, but have been killed in large numbers in Turkey, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and many other Islamic countries, often by their own family members. Freedom of the press and of speech and of assembly along with freedom of religion and the import of Bibles and Christian literature have been denied behind the Islamic curtain just as behind the Iron Curtain. The pressure of world opinion applied year after year and the knowledge of the outside world gained through international radio and television networks played an important part in the fall of communism in Eastern Europe. It was no longer possible to deceive citizens into believing the lie that their economy was better than that of Western countries, once a visible comparison could be made through the knowledge of the West that came via television. Most important, however, was the fact that the system simply didn't produce the paradise that it had been claimed would result from the practice of communism. It was the harsh reality of daily experience that could no longer be denied that eventually broke the back of the regimes in Eastern Europe, and must do the same elsewhere, wherever that system is in control. It is inevitable that the same disillusionment will develop in Islamic countries. There is growing evidence that it is happening already. Islam, which has allied itself with communist nations against Israel, has produced conditions similar to those behind the Iron Curtain in every Arab country where it has been able to remain in control politically as well as religiously. Like Marxism, Islam has failed to produce the ideal society it promised. Thus, many Arab countries today, in spite of their billions of dollars in annual revenues from oil, remain among the most primitive nations in the world, outside of the few large modernized cities. No one can deny that Islam has perpetuated an autocratic feudalism and held back democracy, which is still unknown in Islamic countries. The rights of individual citizens, particularly those of women and minorities, are systematically suppressed, often cruelly, and in the name of Allah. As with communism, the oppressive totalitarianism of Islam has also brought some moral blessings. Like the iron and bamboo curtains, the Islamic curtain, while apparently tolerating a great deal of homosexuality, has kept out much of the Western world's decadence, abortion, youthful rebellion, organized crime, drugs, pornography, and other forms of immorality so rampant in nominally Christian countries such as the United States. One important fact, however, must be borne in mind. The immorality in the West is recognized as contrary to the teachings of the Bible and is pursued in defiance of Christ rather than in his name, while in Islamic countries much evil is due to the Koran itself and is practiced in the name of Allah and in obedience to his prophet Muhammad. 
No one calls for a holy war in the name of Christ, as is done in the name of Allah. Terrorism and the taking of hostages is not done in the name of Christ, but is done in the name of Allah with good conscience. The IRA do not claim to be Christians, but Catholics, and certainly they cannot justify terrorist tactics from the teachings of Jesus. Christ taught us to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, and he sought to win men's hearts with his love. In contrast, Muhammad taught that Islam should be spread by force, and that those refusing to submit should be killed. Many of the most important verses throughout the Quran advocate the killing of apostates and non-Muslims. Muhammad himself led 27 invasions, claiming that God had ordered him to spread Islam at the point of the sword. Not only Muhammad's own kismen, the Quraysh tribe, but almost all of Persia and Turkey, for example, originally became Muslims in this way. The Bani Kareza tribe surrendered to Muhammad in good faith, laying down their arms, and Muhammad then killed hundreds of the men and divided the women and money between himself and Sa'd ibn Mu'az as war booty. While the Quran does not explicitly say so, the teaching in Islam today is that those who die fighting in its defense go immediately to paradise. That belief made the Arab armies virtually invincible. After Muhammad's death, they conquered Persia, Turkey, and all of North Africa, then crossed the Mediterranean to conquer Spain, and were well on their way to taking all of Europe when they were defeated in AD 732 at the Battle of Tours in France. Thus was the quote-unquote faith of Islam taken to the world. It was either submit to Allah and to the teachings of his prophet Muhammad, or die. Such is the shameful heritage of Islam in those countries which it presently controls. It is still quite in keeping with their religion for Muslims to consider it their honorable duty to kill Christians and Jews. Yes, there were the Crusaders who struck back against the Arab invaders, but they did so in disobedience to the Bible. Inspired by Pope Urban II, the members of the First Crusade went to recover, for the church, the land that belonged to Israel. Plundering, raping, and murdering along the way, they slaughtered all the Muslims and Jews in Jerusalem when they took that holy city in the name of the Roman Catholic Church. They were acting in direct violation of the teachings of Jesus, whose cross they claimed to be carrying. Not to be outdone by Islam's promise of instant paradise for those who died in jihad, the Pope motivated his troops by offering a plenary indulgence remitting all punishments due to sin to those who should fall in the war. The call by various popes for holy wars ranks among the worst contradictions of true Christianity from the Dark Ages and would never be repeated today. The shrill cry of jihad, however, is still heard and heeded today, for it is in perfect harmony with Islam and with the deeds of its prophet, Muhammad. It is impossible to understand the current situation in the Middle East, much less anticipate probable future developments there, except in the context of the religion that grips and motivates the Arab world. We don't have time to deal with Islam thoroughly, but a brief understanding of it is essential, particularly in view of the fact that it is the fastest growing religion in the world today. It is spreading everywhere and is likely to be encountered no matter where one lives or travels. In an article titled, What Part Will Religion Play in Emerging Global Struggles?, one syndicated columnist reminds us, quote, in Chicago, which was once considered the heart of Midwestern America, there are now more Muslims than Methodists, more Buddhists than Presbyterians, more Hindus than Congregationalists. It's not particularly chic to mix talk about religion and politics, but there is a connection. Unquote. Indeed, there is a connection, and nowhere is that more apparent than in the Middle East, where Islam is the driving force behind the passion to obliterate the very presence of Israel. Islam means surrender to Allah the God whose revelations were allegedly dictated to the Prophet Muhammad and written down in the Islamic scriptures, the Quran. We can't possibly enumerate the many reasons why the Quran reflects Muhammad's own narrow ideas, rather than being the eternal revelation of God. One major contradiction, however, requires mention. In its early chapters, the Quran endorses the Old Testament and the Gospels of the New Testament as inspired by God, appeals to their authority to authenticate Muhammad's own revelations, and urges obedience to their precepts. For example, Allah says, quote, It was we who revealed the law. Therein was guidance and light. By its standards have been judged the Jews by the prophets who bowed to God's will, 
for to them was entrusted the protection of God's book. And in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him. We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him as a guidance and admonition to those who fear God. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein. To thee, that is Muhammad, we sent the scripture in truth, that is the Koran, confirming the scripture, that is the Bible, that came before it. Unquote. Surah 5, verses 47 through 51. Yet the Koran, after endorsing the Bible, contradicts it by declaring that God is a single personage rather than one God existing eternally in the three persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Jesus did not die upon the cross for our sins and rise again, that salvation is by one's own good works rather than by grace through what God has done for us, and so forth and so forth. The only way Muslims can reconcile the obvious contradictions between the Koran and the Bible which it affirms is to declare that the Bible has been corrupted since the days of Muhammad, which Muslims insist is the case. That this is a blatantly false charge, however, is demonstrated by the many manuscripts in existence from the time of Muhammad and before, which are identical to the Bible we have today. Of course, the Bible must be discredited in order to maintain the claim that the Arabs, as descendants of Ishmael, are the true heirs of God's promises to Abraham. The Quran declares that it was Ishmael, not Isaac, whom Abraham was told to offer to God, and to whose descendants the land of Canaan was given. The Bible says the opposite, but Muhammad was apparently ignorant of that fact at the time he wrote that part of the Quran which endorses the Bible. Some Arabs did settle in the Promised Land, though most of them were scattered throughout the oil-rich nations of the Middle East. In 1948, both Jews and Arabs were living in Palestine. Under the Zionist movement, Jews had been trying to return to the land of their ancestors for decades, but most were being denied entrance. Horrified by the murder of six million Jews in Nazi extermination camps, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine in order to create a small Jewish state as a place for resettlement of the survivors of Hitler's Holocaust. The Palestinian Arabs were given the remainder of Palestine as a state of their own. The Arabs, however, insisted that Allah had promised it all to them and were not willing to allow a Jewish state even to exist. Confident of victory, since Allah had also promised that the armies of Islam would always conquer, the Arabs attacked the Jews with the intention of driving them into the Mediterranean. Thus began the War of 1948. The Jews were forced to fight for their very survival against a far superior force in numbers and equipment. Israel had been allotted such a narrow strip of land along the sea that it was indefensible. Consequently, knowing that the Arabs would likely attack again, as part of her victory, Israel pushed her boundaries outward to a more defensible position. Jordan subsequently annexed the remainder of Palestine that had been given by the United Nations to the Palestinian Arabs. Since then in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, Rather than being integrated into society, the Palestinian Arab refugees have been put into camps, where many of them remain to this day. Thus, the quote-unquote Palestinian problem has been kept alive before the world. The demand is always for Israel to give the Palestinians their own state, never for Jordan to return the land it took. Since the overwhelming forces of seven Arab nations were defeated by tiny newborn Israel in 1948, the relentless cry of the Arabs has been to destroy Israel, to drive their half-brothers, the Jews, into the sea. Our family can never forget being in Egypt in May 1967, just before the Six-Day War broke out. We were in Cairo when Egyptian President Abdul Nasser returned from Moscow, where he had been awarded the Soviet Peace Prize. As he landed at the airport, this man of peace announced that war was imminent and that the Israelis would be annihilated. That goal still obsesses the Arabs, although recently, even terrorists such as Palestine Liberation Organization's chief Yasser Arafat have given lip service to allowing a smaller Israel, with indefensible borders, to exist. The Israelis recognize such talks as public relations window dressing. They live under the constant threat of all-out destruction if the surrounding Arab nations are ever able to accomplish it. Had Israel been left in peace, she would never have enlarged her borders. The Arabs have reaped the results of their own greed and hatred, which frustrates and angers them all the more. 
The extension of Israel's boundaries has only taken place as a result of wars she has been forced to fight in order to defend her very existence. Growing ever more apprehensive at being surrounded by Arabs who continually call for jihad to annihilate her and who still outnumbered her by about 50 to 1, it was even worse in the early days, tiny Israel, victorious only by God's grace, has extended her boundaries in each conflict to more defensible positions. The Golan Heights, for example, were long used by the Syrians for unprovoked sniper and rocket attacks upon the Israeli farm settlements below. In the Yom Kippur War of 1973, while the Egyptians simultaneously attacked across the Sinai, the Syrians poured over the Golan and down into Israel with thousands of tanks. The Israelis, caught by surprise and with only a small fraction of the tanks and men, at great cost of life, drove the Syrians back over the top of the Golan and the Egyptians back to the Suez Canal. Israel has since relinquished the territory it took from Egypt under a peace treaty with that country. On the other hand, in view of the continued threats of extermination from Syria, which, like other Islamic nations, refuses even to acknowledge its existence, Israel prudently retains the Golan Heights in order to prevent its use once again, as in former days, as a point of harassment and attack. When Iraq's forces overwhelmed tiny and defenseless but oil-rich Kuwait, it was only the swift action of the United States responding to Saudi Arabia's urgent appeal for help that prevented Saddam Hussein from moving right on and taking over that country as well. This brought about something that had previously been unthinkable, the presence of quote-unquote infidels upon the soil of the holiest Islamic nation within whose borders both Mecca and Medina, Islam's two most sacred shrines, are located. For the first time in its history, the United Nations responded almost unanimously to oppose with practical and severe steps an aggressor nation, raising hopes of a new world order. Even more amazing, the majority of the Arab states sided with the UN against a fellow Islamic country. There was one demand by Hussein, however, that appealed to most Arabs, that any withdrawal of his forces from Kuwait should be linked to a similar withdrawal of Israel from occupied Palestine. In their joint press conference in Helsinki, Bush and Gorbachev disagreed on this point. Bush, quite correctly, saw no link between the Arab-Israeli dispute and the Gulf crisis. Hussein's takeover of Kuwait was an act of unprovoked aggression, whereas Israel occupies territory that it was forced to take in self-defense. Nevertheless, Gorbachev, who had strongly expressed the USSR's solidarity with the Palestine Liberation Organization in his 1988 UN speech, gave notice of things to come by insisting, quote, It seems to me there is a link here, because the failure to find a solution in the Middle East at large also has a bearing on the acuteness of the particular conflict that is in Iraq-Kuwait we've been talking about here, unquote. Muslims who protested the presence of filthy foreigners upon Islam's holy soil insisted that the Arabs would work out a solution if left to themselves. That rhetoric motivated the Arab masses to stage huge demonstrations in favor of holy war against the United States. In fact, had the United States not stepped in immediately, Iraq would have taken over Saudi Arabia and a few other countries as well. Its power would have grown to the point that it would have been a threat to every Arab state. The pleas of the entire Islamic world to give up the territories it was swallowing would have been scorned by Iraq. Suddenly, thinking Arabs were forced to reevaluate their religion in face of the fact that the territory containing the holiest Islamic shrines had to be defended by infidels against Muslims. Those who had shrugged off the eight-year war between two Islamic nations, Iraq and Iran, that had claimed more than one million lives and during which atrocities, including the use of poison gas, had been perpetrated in the name of Allah, were now faced with some serious questions. How could an Arab leader such as Saddam Hussein call upon all Arabs to join him in holy war and at the same time ruthlessly trample other Islamic nations into the ground? Why were fanatical followers of Islam responsible for most of the terrorism and hostage-taking in the world, and seemed prone to outdo infidels in all manner of atrocities? And if Allah was all-powerful, why did infidels have to defend Mecca, and against Muslims? The Emir of Kuwait received a standing ovation and the promise of full UN backing when he appeared September 27, 1990, before that body's General Assembly, to plead for its help against Iraq. 
Here again was a strange and embarrassing spectacle paraded before the world that contradicted the claims of Islam and tarnished the image of this religion which claims to be superior to all others. An Islamic nation was appealing to a world of infidels to help rescue it from another Islamic nation, which was at that moment plundering, destroying, raping, and torturing, while calling for Muslims to join it in a holy war in defense of its evil deeds. Other embarrassing facts also had to be faced, which could have as far-reaching effects in the Arab world as the recent move from communism to democracy in Eastern Europe. The emir of Kuwait was a feudal monarch who, prior to Iraq's invasion, had muzzled the press and jailed human rights activists. It was unlikely that the UN was interested in reinstating a feudal lord, but rather in freeing his country from Iraq's unlawful takeover. As this book goes to press, the issues remain in doubt. When Kuwait is liberated, however, it would seem that the emir will have to yield to pressures for democratic rule, as will other Arab rulers as well. Much of the reason for the swift and near-unanimous action of the United Nations against Iraq was due to its concern that Saddam Hussein, who had proved to be virtually an Arab Hitler, would take over and control so much of the world's oil reserves that he would have the industrialized nations at his mercy. The well-known fact, accepted in the past, that six ruling Arab families sitting on feudal thrones controlled 44% of the world's oil reserves suddenly became a concern. There are grassroots movements in those countries for greater freedom and rights for citizens. Inevitable political changes must come, weakening Islam's hold as well. It would be surprising if we did not see as great changes in the Arab world as in the communist world, as the stage is set for the rise of Antichrist. The world grows smaller and more interdependent. Barriers are coming down. It is no longer possible to remain isolated behind either an iron curtain or an Islamic curtain. Even the bamboo curtain around China must yield as well to worldwide pressures. It is only a matter of time. As the collapse of communism is providing great opportunity for the gospel to be made known, and many are coming to Christ in Eastern Europe, so the upheavals in the Arab world are bringing similar opportunities. After centuries of almost no response to the gospel, thousands of Muslims are now coming to Christ as a result of facing some of the serious shortcomings and contradictions in Islam. It promises heaven, but offers no assurance of getting there except by death in holy war. As in Catholicism, where enough is never enough to keep one out of purgatory, so in Islam one never knows whether enough prayers have been said, enough alms given, and enough good deeds done to bring one to paradise. Confronted at last by some of the embarrassing questions about Islam, the faith of many Muslims is being shaken. Why did Muhammad, with his new revelation, give his God the same name, Allah, as the chief idol in the Kaaba, the ancient pagan temple at Mecca? And why, although he destroyed the idols which it housed, did Muhammad retain the Kaaba itself as a sacred shrine? And why did he keep and continue to revere the black stone that had long been worshipped along with the idols in the ancient religious ceremonies of Mecca? And why do Muslims consider the Kaaba holy and kiss its black stone as an important part of their pilgrimage to Mecca? Such questions are causing many Muslims to receive the free pardon of sin and assurance of heaven that is offered in Christ. In contrast to Muhammad, Jesus, who as God could have destroyed his enemies with a word, let them crucify him and died in our place to pay for our sins. For those who nailed him to the cross and tortured and taunted him, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a contrast to the famous apostasy wars, where Muslim forces fought against those who had turned away from Islam in order to bring them back to faith or kill them. And that primitive attitude still prevails in Islam. Painful though the admission may be, Intelligent, thinking Arabs can no longer deny that Islam has been responsible for perpetuating a barbaric medieval mentality. Surely they must recognize that the continued taking of hostages and the frequent spectacle on television of crazed mobs screaming, Jihad! 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 Death to Bush! And Death to the United States! does not encourage Western viewers to put much confidence in a peaceful Arab solution to problems in the Middle East. And when a Salman Rushdie,
because he writes something offensive to Muslims, has a price put on his head by Islam's foremost leader, and must go into hiding to save his life from Muslim assassins, are Arabs proud of such barbarism, and do they feel that it commends Islam to the world? As for the treatment of women, to be able to beat one's four wives and unlimited concubines, and to divorce merely by pronouncing it done as the Quran decrees, is criminal. Surely the time for change has come. Unfortunately, the pressure for change is bringing a growing openness to ecumenism that is preparing the Muslim world to embrace the Antichrist. The new attitude was expressed by M. A. Zaki Badawi, principal of the Muslim College of London, while in attendance at the August 1990 San Francisco Assembly of the World Religions. In response to Sun Myung Moon's announcement that he was the New World Messiah, Badawi made this interesting comment, quote, We don't accept Reverend Moon as Messiah, but we respect his vision of bringing the world's religions together, unquote. The next step is easy. Satan's Messiah will have incredible powers that neither Moon nor any of the other lightweight antichrists can display. We have already noted that Jesus specifically declared that Israel would accept the Antichrist. It is no longer so difficult to imagine that with a little more preparation, Muslims too will be able to embrace and even worship the counterfeit Christ while still professing allegiance to Islam. For Islam's Allah, after all, is not the God of the Bible that Muhammad claimed him to be.